The test is in four parts, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. A campus radio station is going to be in action. An interviewer is interviewing a man from the university for the survey. Listen to the conversation between them and circle the best answer from A, B, or C for questions 1 to 4. You now have some time to read questions 1 to 4. Now, we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will never hear the recording for the second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Excuse me, I'm conducting a campus survey. Would you have time to answer a few questions? What's it all about? We're doing some market research for a new campus radio station starting in the next few months. That's OK. Sounds good. Great. I'll just work through this form with you. And if we could start with some personal background information? Sure. Right. If I could have your age, please. 26. OK, good. And are you a student, teacher or in another job? Well, I'm a tutor, but I'm also a postgraduate student, so I don't know what you might call me. What do you think? OK, well, I'm more of a teacher, really. Fine. And would you mind if I asked about your salary, or I could leave it blank? No, that's OK. It's $20,000 a year. Thanks. Right. Now about your current listening habits. What would you say is your main reason for listening to radio? Well, I'm usually busy during the day at work, so I usually only listen to the radio at night. It helps me relax and unwind, even if I'm studying. Good. And how many hours a day on average do you listen to the radio? Well, not a lot really. I'd say just over an hour, all told. Now you have some time to read questions 5 to 10. Now listen to the second part of the interview and answer questions 5 to 10. So, what are the two main times of the day that you listen to the radio? Well, for a little while around breakfast time, and then it tends to be later, after dinner, when I've finished any serious work I need to do. And what sort of radio programs do you like? I like the news, but I also like classical music. It helps me to relax. Fine. And turning to the new campus station, which type of programmes would you prefer? I think the existing radio stations cater for my need for news. So I'd like to see programmes about local information, you know, providing a service to the campus community. And in the same vein, perhaps more for academic viewers, you know, some lectures or relevant programmes. Oh, I see. And if you had to give the new directors some specific advice when they set up the station, what would you tell them? I think I'd advise them to be careful about the quality of the broadcasts. You know, the sound system. There are a lot of radio stations and people can change their loyalty quickly if it doesn't meet their needs. I think they should do more of these kinds of interview too, you know, talking with existing and potential customers. Oh, I'm pleased you think it's useful. Certainly, yeah. Good. Now, this station will not be fully funded by the university. So how often do you think it is tolerable to have adverts? I think... Well, out of that list, I'd say every quarter of an hour. Of course, that's providing they don't last for ten minutes each time. Oh, quite. And are you interested in attending any of the special promotions for the new station? Yes, I'd be happy to, as long as they're held on the campus or nearby. OK, I'll note that down. And finally, may we put you on our mailing list? Well, I prefer not except for the information about the promotions you just mentioned. OK. Can I have your name and address? Of course. I have a card I can give you. Oh, great. And thanks a lot for your time, and we look forward to seeing you. Yeah, sure. Mmm, thanks. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a talk about Runwell, 
a charity that raises money by organising running races. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now listen to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 17. I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to tell you something about the Run Well charity and the work we do. I'll give a brief overview of what we do, and I hope you may be able to help, and then there'll be time for questions at the end. Runwell's founder, Mike Hughes, took up long-distance running in 1987, raising money by doing sponsored half-marathons, and in 1992 established the charity as we know it today. By 1997, the runs were being filmed by local TV and today they appear on national TV every year. All the funds collected by Runwell go to the hospital, with the idea that those fit enough to run use their energy to assist the provision of people who are unwell for whatever reason. Now, if you want to race, and I assume that's why many of you are here, let me explain a couple of the basics. Races are run by teams, so you need to form and register a team. What you wear to run in is up to you, and I know some teams come up with some pretty wacky ideas. We have a standard design for your numbers, which we ask you to reproduce. So you make them up according to that standard. We don't want to spend valuable funds on doing that ourselves. Now, the race is run as a kind of relay, so while you won't actually compete side by side, we do recommend that you train as a group. This helps to optimise performance and build team spirit. It will also give you a fair idea of how much you need to eat and drink over the race distance. This is clearly essential for an effective performance, so please make sure you come along to the race with sufficient food and drink. Again, we don't spend money on providing that, but you do need to keep yourself going for the 20-kilometre course. The course goes through the town, then out through Highfield Park, concluding in the main square, where the applauding spectators will be ready to greet you. There are many different prizes, including oldest runner, youngest runner, team with the most sponsorship, team with the best costume. That one's donated by Zoom Fashions. The mayor will introduce the Minister for Health, who will hand over each prize to the winners, and then the hospital president will make a short speech. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. OK, that's the big race. But I know there are many people who don't feel they are up to running a 20-kilometre race, but who would nevertheless like to raise money for Run Well. Over the years, we've had experience of many ways of trying to collect money, some very successful, others less so. Now, of course, 20 kilometres is too far for children to run. But there was a sponsored swimming event at the local school last year, and that did very well. People have also tried to organise food-based events, such as selling homemade cakes and bread and so on at the market. And there was a large picnic arranged in four bright gardens, although these events failed to justify the efforts put into them, though I'm sure they were very tasty. These days, so many people are out at work all day that going from house to house to collect money isn't very effective. But it is possible to raise useful funds by selling small promotional items, such as badges with the Run Well motif on them. We're currently checking to see if postcards, perhaps showing the race's winners each year, might also be a good idea or not. We do appreciate the efforts that have gone into selling second-hand goods, but to be honest, the returns have not been very high on this. 
One very dedicated group organised a team quiz recently, which went very well, and it would be good to see more such activities. There's also been talk of a concert, but we'll have to see how plans for that progress. Now, are there any questions at this stage? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a tape recording of instructions and advice, which a woman called Martha has left for her friend John, who is coming to stay at her house and take care of it while she is away. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Now, listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Hello, John. Welcome to the house. I'm really pleased that you can be here to look after my house while I'm away. Here are some things you need to know about the house: important stuff like when the garbage is collected. In fact, let's start with the garbage, which is collected on Friday. Just write garbage on the calendar on the days they take it away. Put it out on Friday every week. That'll be Friday twenty second, Friday twenty ninth, and Friday fifth. It's a really good service. The trucks are quiet and the service is efficient. The bin will be put back outside the house empty. It's a good idea to put it away quickly. This street can be quite windy. I once watched my next door neighbour chase her bin the whole length of the street. Every time she nearly caught up with it, it got away again. The waste paper will be collected this Tuesday. That's Tuesday nineteenth. There's a plastic box full of paper in the front room. Please put it out on Tuesday. The truck will come during the day. If you don't mind collecting old newspapers and other paper and putting them in the box, I'll put it out when I come home. The paper people only come monthly. I have some things to give to charity in a box in the front room. Would you put it out on Monday the twenty-fifth, please? It's a box of old clothes and some bed linen which I've collected, plus a few other bits and pieces. Be careful when you pick it up because it's heavier than you might expect. The charity truck will come by during the day on the last Monday of the month. If you want to use the library, you'll find it on Darling Street. I've left my borrower's card near the telephone. It has a very good local reference section if you want to find out more about this city. I'm sorry to say we don't have a cleaner. Oh yes, filters. Please, would you change the filters on the washing machine on the last day of the month, which is Sunday the thirty-first? We find that the machine works much better if we change the filters regularly. The gas company reads the meter outside the house, so don't worry about that. I think that's all the information about our calendar of events. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-five to thirty. Well, John, I'm trying to think what else I should be telling you. As you know, I'm going to a conference in London. I hope to have a little time to look around. It's a great city. I do hope I manage to get to at least some of the theatres and museums. I'm looking forward to all the things I have to do at the conference too. I'm giving a paper on Tuesday the twenty-sixth, and there are a couple of really exciting events planned later in the conference program. I hope to meet up with an old teacher of mine at the conference. She taught English literature at my old high school, and we've kept in touch through letters over the years. She teaches now at the University of Durham, and I'm really looking forward to seeing her again. By the way, I expect you're hungry after your trip. I've left a meal in the refrigerator for you. I hope you like cheese and onion pie. Would you do me a favour, please? I haven't had time to cancel an appointment. It was made a long time ago, and I forgot about it until this morning. It's with my dentist for a checkup on Thursday, the twenty-eighth. Could you please call the dentist on eight one six two five two five and cancel the appointment for me? Thanks a lot, John. One last thing: when you leave the house, make sure the windows and doors are shut, and set the burglar alarm. The alarm code number is nine one two zero. Enter. Have fun. I'll see you when I get back. This is your friend Martha saying goodbye. 
That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Turns to part four. Part four. You will hear an expert on birds talking about sparrows, one of the most common bird species in urban and suburban environments around the world. The expert discusses some possible causes for their declining numbers. First, you will have half a minute to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully to the talk and answer questions 31 to 40. Some people dislike sparrows and see them as annoying pests in their neighbourhood. Others see them as an interesting part of the urban environment. Love them or hate them, it could be that the familiar scene of these birds flying, hopping and chirping in our city streets will soon become a thing of the past. Until recently, there were so many sparrows around that people tried all kinds of methods to get rid of them, but it now seems that many people are starting to worry about the declining numbers of sparrows in many cities around the world. Over the past 20 or 30 years, sparrows have been disappearing throughout many parts of the world. In Britain, since the 1920s, the overall population of sparrows has declined by 92%. In London, they were once so plentiful that people who conducted regular surveys did not bother to count them because they were simply too common. Now there are none. This decline has also been recorded in some cities in continental Europe, parts of North America and India as well. Some people will be surprised at this as they probably still see many sparrows in their local neighbourhood. But whereas some suburbs may have large numbers of sparrows, in the next suburb there may be none. So, why are they disappearing rapidly in some areas, yet still exist in large numbers in others? Well, it is a bit of a mystery. Some say it is due to local issues. There are a number of factors here, one of which is harassment or predation. Other local animal species harass them and domestic cats hunt them for food. Secondly, there is increased competition both for food and for nesting sites from other seed-eating birds in the neighbourhood. And thirdly, it is now more difficult for sparrows to make nests in modern buildings due to more effective modern building methods. Recent studies suggest that another reason may be related to a problem with the breeding success of the sparrows. Although they continue to breed, the young nestlings keep dying. These deaths have been linked to a lack of insects, such as aphids. This decrease in the availability of insects, it is believed, then causes the young nestlings to die of starvation or dehydration. It seems that there is a growing worldwide shortage of insects, and our modern urban lifestyle with the increasing use of motor vehicles is being blamed for it. It is suggested that the carcinogenic chemicals released into the atmosphere by unleaded car exhaust fumes is having an impact on insect numbers. Another theory, which is thought to be affecting sparrow numbers, is connected to our technological advancement. According to some experts, the mobile telephone towers that are now a feature of our modern cities emit electromagnetic radiation, which might affect the sparrow's central nervous systems and result in their death. The evidence is only circumstantial, and sparrows still continue to thrive in some major cities. However, it is interesting to note that in the 1990s, the use of mobile phones and unleaded petrol skyrocketed, and both coincide with the period of the sparrows' declining numbers in many modern cities. That is the end of the listening test. You now have half a minute to check your answers.